So the disruptive workforce, Catherine, can we start perhaps with a definition? What do we mean? What do you think of when we talk about the disruptive workforce? So John, I think it's, it's recognising that change is happening in the workforce. Um, in some workforces, faster than others. But nonetheless, I think we're seeing change in expectations, uh, uh, both from the employee and indeed the employer. Uh, and that is uh, leading to some quite significant disruptions around this whole topic. That's what I, I think about when I think about this subject. Very good. Asani, same for you. Is that what it's about? It's about the changing expectations, both of the employee and the employer? Absolutely. I, I would agree with that. Um, I think with the, the amount of technology that we have today, uh, different capabilities, um, the expectations of us all have, have shifted. Um, people are used to being able to uh, get products and services in their own time and I think that's shifted into the workplace where people are expecting to be able to operate effectively at work at their own pace um, in, in a way that's flexible and convenient for them. And it manifests itself how? It's about flexibility, about not necessarily working from home being accessible everywhere, is that what it's about? I think one of the manifestations is in the style of work um, that people um, are getting more and more accustomed to. So working from home, when I started my career, was uh, what a fringe benefit, right, that you would got to do every now and again. And um, whereas uh, more and more today, it's becoming a table stakes default capability and that people are expecting uh, businesses to be able to support. But at the same time, as a business, we need to be um, clear that um, working in a different type of way is still going to be effective. It's still going to enable us to uh, provide the services and products for our, our customers. Very good, and we'll come back to working from home because that feels like a central part of this, even if it is table stakes. Um, but Jim, just the same opening question to you, that workforce, that disruptive workforce, what does it mean for you and your organisation? I, I agree completely with what uh, my two colleagues here mentioned. Uh, additionally, I, I do think that <clears throat> the younger generations are bringing with them um, a new comfort with technology that, that we didn't have. And I think that we can learn a lot from the, the newer um, generations coming in because they, they have technology every day of their life and they expect the technology in their workplace, whether it's at home or remote or at a headquarters, for example, they expect that to work as easily and um, quickly as it does for them at home. So if that's the disruption, how is it changing the workplace itself? One way that it, uh, that it will absolutely change it and does currently is just the amount of um, video conference and audio conferences that, that we have. We have a, a larger workforce that's working outside of the traditional office, but that doesn't lessen the need for collaboration. In fact, it probably increases it. Seven out of 10 current meetings are virtual meetings. Um, so that's really changed, I think, the style of how we conduct meetings, whether we're participants or the meeting uh, organizer. And our reliance on technology, whether it's um, video conference, software-based video conference technology, whether it's the microphones or loudspeakers, being heard, being seen is um, more important, I think, than ever. That sense of collaboration, the conference technology, the collaborative tools, is that all in one direction? Is that all positive or are there some downsides with using this kind of technology? Well, because I work for a company that's based on the technology, it's all positive. <laughs> but in, in reality, um, you miss, you know, nothing will, I don't think anything will uh, ever replace face-to-face -face conversation. Um, you get so much from body language, from real tone of voice that you might not necessarily get today. But I think as we evolve, I think we're going to get closer and closer to what a real face-to-face -face conversation will feel like, uh, but across an ocean or time zones. But I think just to build on that, um, I think people need some physical interaction at times. You know, however good it is to be able to see those facial expression nuances, I do think the actual physical social aspects is quite important to And is this something we are inevitably losing as we go to this virtual uh, workplace? I think you have to consciously think about how you design that into future work or else it, it, I think you're right, it, it will disappear. And uh, it's, it's much about, as I say, thinking about how you can introduce that and creating perhaps different physical kind of experiences and so forth because uh, you know, I think that human need is quite strong. Because some people might imagine that this is all positive because if you can work from home and you can work flexibly then you're choosing the time at which you work, yeah. you're choosing the place that, in which you work. Um, but there is a downside around sociability, around alienation? I think so, yes. Uh, and also sort of things like stress. 
you know, we're in a 24-7, 365, uh, on-demand world. Um, and whilst there is, I think, a lot more expectation about choice of when you work, how long you work, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you, are, you are on call, if you like, all the time. And I think that that's levels of stress alongside perhaps an alienation need to be thought about in terms of how you motivate, stimulate, uh, and look after the welfare of your, your workforce. Absolutely agree. And, and I think as we're all looking at kind of, a, many of us are looking at a global economy, looking at global opportunities, just the number of late night or early morning conference calls um, that you have to get on if you're in the US or if you're in Asia, here in London, you guys have it made because it's like one o'clock or two o'clock in the afternoon. You've had coffee, you're ready to go. But that does put a stress on, on your personal life. It puts a stress on you know, the amount of sleep and, and everything else that, you're, uh, that you have to deal with. So there's, there's good and bad to, to both sides. And I, I, the other part I want to mention is that the, maybe the senior leadership at times or the folks who have, who have been working longer than um, the younger generation coming in, they need to make sure that they are working uh, with this remote employee in mind. What I mean by that is, you know, they, they want everyone to meet together, to be face to face, but in reality, it's just not possible. And they'll book a meeting that's absolutely at a crazy hour for someone else working remotely. They, they need to kind of be more empathetic, I think, to the remote work environment. I think this feels like we're at the crux of this, which is how do you balance the, the, the well-being of the employee with the productivity needs of the business? Um, and sometimes these things are at odds, and we've talked about how leadership can help. Uh, how would you go about? Uh... I, I think it's, it's fascinating that, uh, on one hand, the flexibility has um, transformed so many different lives. I can talk from personal experience. A couple of days a week, I have to do the school run, which happens in the middle of the day. Um, in the old ways of working, that would have been impossible. That's just not um, a suitable way of operating. In today's world, you're right, that does mean, okay, you're working a bit longer into, um, into the night um, or starting a bit earlier, but you're working around your, your situation. So there are trade-offs, but for you, oh, the trade-offs are worth paying. So you're going to be working until nine or 10 at night, but you have and get I, that I time think, back during the day. I think the way business has evolved to is the time is not actually the issue anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so the output or the value that you're driving is the actual, um, is the actual target. For some of us, yes, we're in jobs and roles that do have a time factor to it. So my call center staff, yes, they have a time that they need to be around to facilitate um, the service to my customers. But for many people in knowledge work, um, the time that they're sat at their desk entering data into a keyboard is not actually not what most of us leaders are focused on. It's, okay, how effective can you be um, to produce that? And I think that's where technology is enabling that flexibility to enable you to produce your best work at the best time. And I think just piggybacking on uh, John's point on the, uh, uh, the younger demographic of, of people coming into the, into the workforce who just have a very different mindset to how they approach work, what they expect um, from what Christina talked about, that expectation management that um, a different demographic have from maybe myself and maybe somebody who's even more mature than myself who worked from a different generation. Uh, they expect that flexibility is as it. They're, they've got their, their iPads, they've got their iPhones, they've got their Android phones. They expect to be on call all the time. That is not really a big issue. Whereas for me, it might have been, oh no, I want to be able to segregate this p- uh, portion of my life as work and this proportion. And does that get to the heart of it? Yeah, Catherine, the, we often frame this conversation about a uh, emerging millennial mm. generation and their needs and their expectations. And that might leave behind people already in the workplace who have very different expectations. Yeah, I think it's very easy to sort of stereotype and think about sort of one type of employee. Uh, and yet actually, you know, we've got a huge diversity of ages and, and, and cultures and so forth that we're grappling with and across culture, international boundaries and so forth. Um, and I think there's some common themes, but there are also differences which we need to respect. So as you say, I think that's a great example of, for some people, um, that work-life balance and managing that, or indeed structures and systems in in, in an organisation. For some people, they like coming to an office and separating kind of work from home. And when you talk about structures and systems, systems with a small s rather than exactly. IT systems. Exactly right, yes. Um, so for those people, that, that, is, that is helpful in terms of that's, that, that gives them structure in order to be productive. Uh, for other people, it's the opposite. Um, I was interested, I mean, I was reflecting just mentally whilst you were talking. When I first went to, to work, 
you just could not work from home because it was believed, A, that you would be completely unproductive, skiving, frankly, <laughs> uh, and B, you know, unless you had something that you could do offline, you know, there was no internet when I started. I am quite old. Um, <laughs> You know, so it was impossible, but it very much frowned upon. So both sort of physical and, and sort of, uh, you know, um, psychological barriers to it. Now we understand that actually it aids productivity. You know, and you probably get far more out of your workforce because they're not commuting. They don't they have more opportunity to manage what's important in your life and so forth. Those are big changes. And I want to come back to the role of technology uh, for good or potentially for ill um, and how we mitigate some of the potential problems of this new way of working. But just to pick up on Jim's point around leadership, what is the, is, is there a changing role of leadership in order to uh, deal with these changing workplaces? Yeah, I'm sure, uh, sure Jim will, will, will add to it. But yes, again, if you think about the kind of old style of um, you know, supervision and control and how you affected that through seeing people physically and, and all the rest of it, that's gone. You need to find different ways of managing, motivating, empowering, inspiring your work, workforce. Um, what their expectations are different of you as a leader, not just of the employer generally. Um, because after all, we could use the technology to, to uh, as a form of surveillance to make sure that people are doing the, the hours they say they're doing, that they're producing the output that they're saying they're doing. But yep. you're, from what I'm hearing, that's probably not the best approach. No, I think it's about tr trusting people. I think it's about coaching. It's about mentoring. Uh, and very much, you know, it's, it, people have moved, I think, from even the sort of knowledge working into the learning worker because people have multiple careers. They need very different skills at the fast pace. And so actually, how do you help people learn as opposed to control the job that they do is, I think, a much better output uh, in today's world. Jim, you might have some views. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. And I, I think um, when you look at what leadership could do, um, I think for me, it comes down to kind of empathy and understanding the needs of, of the associates, right? And understanding the multi-generational aspect of, of that and looking more at the production of work rather than the process of their work, right? And with that, they need to be able to provide the right tools for the right people. But I think it's it's incumbent on many of us to work with senior leadership to say, these are the benefits, this is the return, if we can get these tools, if we can hire, like for example, if we're looking to hire somebody for a marketing role, we no longer just have to look in you know downtown London, if we have an office, or Chicago, or wherever. We can look anywhere in the world and find the best person for our company, wherever they're they're living, which is a huge benefit. And then you look at productivity, you look at the, the ability of us, of the team to make a decision quickly rather than having to fly all over and meet somewhere and deal with jet lag and, you know, have a meal and how expensive that could be and time consuming. Now you can make a decision very quickly. And then I think you can need to look at the retention of valuable associates, people who are excited to be working for the company, who maybe are a younger generation, but get the work done. If you don't provide them the kind of tools and flexibilities that flexibility that they need, they're going to look elsewhere. But there is no getting around the fact that leadership today is more complicated because you have virtual teams, you have flexible teams, you have teams from around the world. So that's that's tough on leadership, right? Absolutely. I think it's a it's a it's a privilege of leadership. I think the the. The challenges of leadership just change and evolve over time, right? So a senior leader from 50 years ago, before globalization was a thing, would have think, oh no, I've got my, my hands full, and then things have shifted over a period of time. And I think the one of the key um, challenges of leadership today is you cannot assume anymore. So I think previously you had the, the privilege of assuming my staff will do as I tell them, right? They're going to operate in this way. I've said they need to do it in this way, and they will do that. Um, whereas in today's market, that is not the case. It is much more of, okay, how are you going to facilitate your um, team members to produce their best work because they want to, right? Because they've got so many options, so many choices to go elsewhere and do other things um, that you have to be more facilitator rather than, okay, I'm giving down some orders, off you go. And then also the, the other part of it is because business is moving so fast, we need our people to be thinking, to be, so we need them to be learning and changing and adapting. So we need them to be proactively finding new opportunities, um, new think, ways of working, 
rather than waiting for me to say this is the new way we need them to be um, adapting and we've spoken a lot about the onus on the leadership and maybe you were getting to that in the final part of your answer but what is what's the responsibility of the employee in this situation what's the what's their responsibility so i i think there's there's a, there's a number so one of the responsibilities is we are part of a team so that employee is part of a team to help the team achieve its goals. So in my in my business, um, that is serving insurance um, for our customers and making sure that our customers are being well taken care of. So everybody is part of that effort um, to make that happen. So if you're an engineer in one of my teams or if you're in the call center, that is our end goal, serving, serving our customers. And I think for lots of employees today, they want to be bought into that, that vision. So some might say, actually, that's not what, where I want to get my value from. I want to do something more creative in another area um, or something um, that they perceive as more valuable in a different area too. So I think as an employee, as part of that team or that organization, you're bought into that vision. And I think that is more and more of a thing um, uh, over time. Catherine, same question. Yeah, well, I think for me, um, trust is mutual, you know, and if either side kind of abuses that, then that breaks down and, and, and so forth. So I think there is a, there's an expectation, an obligation on employees to respect the fact that we're trying to do things differently and not monitor them and not this and other and, and perform in a different environment. Um, I think the, the, you know, technology helps. We used to kind of say, you know, I go to work and I leave my brain outside the door kind of thing. I have these amazing skills that organizations don't make use of um, now actually you've got the tools that you can now it's your choice as to whether you do that you know an organization can facilitate it but actually it's up to the individual to say actually i can bring more to the party and i'm going to bring more so i think that's another response and as a non-executive director you see a range of organizations doing things presumably well and doing things badly what are some of the things that organizations are doing well what, what do you observe? So I think the first thing is, uh, as with many things, it comes from the top, you know. So organisations are shadows of their leaders. I believe that firmly. I've seen that. So I think tone from the top, actions from the top, behaviours from the top, that's what really drives to whether that cascades down. And if it's from the top, presumably most of those people at the top are not millennial yeah. demographic. So they're having to learn this stuff that may feel unnatural to them. Yes, without a doubt, and that's quite uncomfortable for some. Um, but also, you know, even if you're not very good at it, you can facilitate an environment where people flourish. Okay, that's your job as a leader. It's not actually always do, doing the doing and, and so forth. Sometimes it's about creating an environment uh, through, you know, as you say, the things you do, the, the uh, systems with small s that you enforce or not. Uh, the sort of people that you bring in, the sort of environment, the sort of tone of communications, all those kind of things, how visible you are, how, how um, you know, approachable you are and so forth. So those kind of things, I think um, you can learn those. You know, you know, uh, uh, you're never too old to learn, right? <laughs> I have to believe that. <laughs> Jim, uh, and Hassani, but Jim first, uh, I'd, I'd like to dig into to, to your company. Do, do, would you describe it is a disruptive workplace, a disruptive workforce. Is, is, is that your experience? This, is, this isn't being recorded, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely um, not. <laughs> frankly speaking, I, I would suggest that, that um, Shore is um, one foot in disruptive workforce and one foot in old school. Um, but it's, it's clearly driving towards uh, disruptive workforce. And I entirely agree with what, what uh, Catherine was just saying, r related to the leader, the CEO. One thing uh, to add to what she said is that if the CEO, in my opinion, needs to like kind of take their ego, put it aside, um, and listen to other people. And and many times, it's the the new generation coming in that has these great ideas that because they're way more connected than we ever were. Not just technology, but just in life, really. And and I think the days of the CEO or any of us as leaders being the be all end all i know everything about what i'm trying to do is gone and you're suggesting to me that ceos can put their ego to one side well <laughs> i'm sure there's some that can some Very somewhere good. in the way certainly ours has we put that on the tape but but again i it, it is a matter of, of bringing people along so they're part of the decision making they're part of like hey 
employees, we, we want your suggestions and the best collaboration tool that you think is out there. Here are some examples. Go let me know what, what's available. And then it's you know bringing that information up and then the, the leadership layer says, I trust in what you guys said, so let's, let's try it. And I don't think that happens enough at all. It's only the same question to you in terms of your own experience of either a disruptive workforce or disruptive workplace. Uh, I would say that we, we definitely aspire to be an example um, of that disruptive workplace and workforce. Um, and I just piggybacking on uh, what Catherine and Jim said, I think trust is a big part of that um, and being brave. Because I think um, the old school traditional leadership, um, you're based on your, your own results and your own decisions. And therefore, you want to make all the decisions um, and send those down. Um, where I think uh, what we try to do and what I try to exemplify is I don't have all the answers. That's okay, because I know you guys may have many better answers than, than I do. An example, there was a collaboration tool that my engineers wanted to, to use. It's going to be quite expensive. Um, but part of our culture is, okay, if you think there's value in this tool, it's going to make us better. It's going to take us forward. Mm -hmm let's run a trial, let's do an experiment um, to see if that thing is going to be of value. And so now it's down to you, you've um, given this example, you didn't wait for me to come up with a solution to a problem that you've got, you've come up with a, a solution to a problem you've identified, all right, let's test it. And, and now you are motivated to get everybody else on board and to make that work. Years ago, that would have been a top-down initiative, or right, we're looking at how do we optimize um, some of the collaboration around an engineer let's implement this tool, get some champions, and get them get them to roll it out for us. Now people are doing that for themselves. And it's, and it's also, to, to borrow Jim's phrase, it's, it's, it's taking the ego out of the situation as well. We are all going to win together, um, and we all lose to, together. We want to minimize those losses, hence we do a trial, we do an experiment. Is it so in value? Um, and once, even once it's shown value, we're gonna review it again in six, nine, 12 months. Is it still showing value, or do we need to do something different? We shouldn't underestimate how hard that shift is because people have this has become CEOs by the old system, if you like. Knowledge was power, um, et cetera, et cetera. And changing that and sort of saying, I'm not going to do the things that made me successful. Now it's about, yeah. you know, it's about information sharing is where you get your power from. It's really quite a tough one. So. We talk about all this as though it's kind of, oh yeah, it's coming, blah, blah, blah. But, but as ever, some of these changes will take longer uh, and inevitably take longer. Um, and what will push those old leaders who have that old way of seeing things, that the authority comes through, the knowledge and the power that they have, uh, how do we push them over the top? Well, I think ultimately um, it'll be success driven. You know, you'll mm -hmm. look at organisations that are successful, why are they successful? versus yours you know, as part of the role of the board is to look at the performance and look at others and so forth and push and challenge um, as to whether you know how we can do things better and you know I firmly believe that you know this will produce we've, we've seen the benefits of greater productivity and so forth this will produce better outcomes for all stakeholders not just employees but customers the community and so forth uh, as well as shareholders uh, and actually that's what will drive change yeah, uh, totally agree. And, and I was just thinking about, um, t to Shore, my company, we, about a year ago, uh, we went through a, a significant change. Previously, we had you know, headquarters based in Chicago, Illinois, and then we had um, business unit leaders from based on geography, so APAC, EMEA, Americas. And then within each of those um, regions, we had country managers. So word would come from the top to say, hey, we need to do whatever, and it'd be filtered, filtered, filtered. And whether or not the people in that particular country did what was asked of leadership, it was tough to kind of connect those dots. So about a year ago, we went to a matrix organization to where leadership now can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be in Chicago. I mean, our, our executive board is, is there, um, of course, and our CEO. But after that, you know, I have associates that report into me in uh, Hong Kong and in China and in Japan and in London and France and on and on and on, which is totally different because now it's centralized. And whereas before, information sharing, you know, it comes from local into regional to top, and then then maybe it comes back down to the other region, maybe. And what it's 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 a different message all the way around, and that's been a, a huge change and, and uncomfortable 
Um, I think for a lot of folks who were kind of used to the old school, kind of, I'm the boss of this office and I have a boss who's in charge of the region and who has a boss that's in charge of the whole company. That's kind of gone. Uh, that was a change that was driven by seeing the potential efficiencies yes. available. Yeah, the, the, because we're, we're going after a lot of global business like other companies, you want consistency across, across the globe, whether it's pricing, positioning, marketing, um, and the time it took to make decisions was just incredibly long, and this has is, this is greatly shortened that. Just as a final part of this discussion, I want to return to talking about the technology. We've talked a lot about systems and people and culture, which is absolutely right, but the role that technology... So, Sonny, what is the role that technology plays? I think we've discussed that sometimes it can be a force for good, introducing collaboration, introducing flexibility, but there are some downsides to it around stress and alienation, potentially. Um, what role does it play moving forward? I think it's it's uh, another really interesting topic that we're going to be learning about more and more over the next next few years as it becomes more of the dominant way of working flexibly. That that being that being said, for me, the same technology that allows us to work flexibly um, and to not just have meetings physically together, um, we are looking at utilizing that same technology to connect socially uh, as well. So why not have a coffee meeting? with a friend over a video conference. Right? Um, we've created a social barrier that no, that video conference is only for a meeting, a formal meeting where we're going to be sharing um, some business information. Um, but we're looking at, okay, why shouldn't that also be having a five, 10 minute coffee together over a video con and just having a conversation like you would if you were in the office that might mitigate some of that loneliness or that alienation factor. That so same technology factor. but reimagining how you use it. And I think that is what's happening with um, a lot of industry is that the, the same technologies are being leveraged by startups, um, digital giants um, and traditional businesses. They're just reshifting the balance of that technology um, and creating new ways of working, creating new opportunities. And that's what we think is going to help um, balance out some of those um, negative effects of um, working uh, so distributedly. Catherine, same question, the role of technology, emerging technology or existing technology? Yeah, well, I think it's both because, you know, for most organisations, we have a long legacy of old systems that constrain us versus kind of new newcomers, spaghetti everywhere and so forth. And, and you know, poor old employees have to grapple with the old stuff as well as new. So I think, um, uh, you know, that isn't going away. Um, so I think, you know, the opportunity to uh, utilize where you can stuff that really does help, um, that they're used to in terms of, you say, homeworking type, type tools. Um, and uh, embrace those kind of things, not just in terms of kind of the, the obvious things like collaboration and so forth, but you know how how we pay people. You know the the innovations in payment technology is huge. Well, you know why do we still pay people off payroll kind of on the 29th of the month and through their bank account when actually they probably want it on their mobile wallet or whatever. You know, so I think we need to think broadly about that whole employee piece, and it's not just about the collaboration networking. Uh, piece. It's about you know, the whole interaction with your organisation. How do you embrace the new technology for them? At the same time, recognise they also have to work with the old technology. Jim, the same question to you. The role of technology, existing or emerging technologies? Uh, agree that it's both. And I think it's very exciting uh, to look at the emerging technologies. I, I think, you know, the goal would be, especially because it's global and associates are working everywhere, different time zones, everything else, you don't, you can't, you don't want technology to, to prevent you from uh, being productive, obviously. But, you know, if you look at the number of, of, or the number of minutes per, say, conference call that, that all of us probably enjoy all the time, spent on, can you hear me? Can you see my screen? <laughs> you know, uh, your mic's muted, you know, um, that's, that, that adds up over a long, long period of time. And, and so I think the trend is to make things just so much easier and to, to make these connections feel effortless. And technology can, can do that. Um, I've said this before, but if, um, if, if uh, users of a, of a technology or a conference system or whatever it might be start talking about, say, the microphone, hey, this microphone is terrible, then obviously we're not doing the right job. It needs to just be flawless and, and, and productive to, to what 
we need to do in the We have a fundamental problem sometimes with this. There was nervous laughter when you talked about the conference call that goes wrong. We've all been there. Is there a danger that technology becomes its own worst enemy, that our experiences put us off using the technology again? It, absolutely. I mean, um, we, I mentioned this in one of the other sessions, but at the end of the day, we can't really fix stupid. That sounds mean. But, you know, if, if someone is, is tapping the table where a microphone is, for example, or someone's having a side conversation, but the microphone is in the ceiling and is able to pick up all these different side conversations, that's just bad meeting video conference etiquette, basically. Um, so a lot of training, I think, needs to occur. Um, where you actually go through, okay, you may not hear it because it's the far side of the conversation that is hearing this disruptive tapping or whatever else. You don't, you can't tell. You think it's just fine having a meeting. Um, so that, that's another hurdle that technology can help but won't ever fix. And one other thing I wanted to mention, technology, I think, uh, can really help us to make better decisions uh, as a company. Um, you know, the cost of real estate, for example, opening an office here in London, which we did two weeks ago, um, if we're not utilizing those meeting rooms, um, we're wasting money, right? So how do we tell those meeting rooms are being used? Okay, well, you can look at a scheduler or a calendar that says, well, someone booked so-and-so room, but does that mean they actually use that room? Or, um, you know, in, in the future, or, or they use the room, but what do they use it for? If, if you had the ability to tell if one person out of five people did most of the talking in that room at that time, that's not really a collaboration, that's a presentation. Right, you know, I mean, you can get really into the metrics of this, uh, it's AI and all that, about um, how these rooms are being utilized as a return on investment. So that's a whole other topic, but I think very important one. Thank you very much. A, a final question to you all, and a piece of advice, please. So somebody, and Hassani, I'll start with you again, if you don't mind. An organization that is coming to terms or failing to come to terms with the fact they have a disruptive workforce and things are changing, what one piece of advice would you give them as they contemplate what to do next? That's a really, really tough question because um, the variety of businesses is so vast, right? And the variety of the different challenges that each business will be, will be taken is different. And I, I'm a big believer in you play the cards that you're dealt, right? So some businesses can be a bit more nimble and take up job opportunities in a different way and some just have a bit more legacy and uh, they've got different challenges. However, I think the key um, thing for it is what is the end goal? So what are you trying to achieve? What is the workforce that you're trying to to design and get in an ecosystem um, and a way of working that really facilitates that and takes you on on that journey? Um, that takes a lot of bravery, um, takes a bit of creativity to, to to make that happen. If it's very different from where you are today, um, to go on that journey does take a, take a lot of work. Don't underestimate it. Catherine, same question to you. Piece of advice. I would say uh, treat it like you think about customers. Lots of companies talk about being customer-centric, but actually they don't actually ask their customers and they don't start <laughs> truly from the customer experience. They, they make assumptions. Uh, I think that's the same with employees. So I would say if you're in that predicament, actually use the opportunity to engage the very people that you're trying to, to uh, you know, address and so forth and work, work with them, use their skills, their knowledge, their motivation, and, and build the, the ecosystem. And I think that's a great, great expression because it is all about ecosystems. But build it from the employee outwards, same as you would with the customer. Jim, same question to you. One piece of advice. One piece. Um, I totally agree with, with, with what they said. And um, another way to look at it and I think about is, is understanding that the leverage has kind of changed to where before... I think businesses looked at like people want to work for me. They want to work here. They want a job. Now it's, you know, the, the gig economy and people are, they can work wherever they want to work. So consider that person, the new, new people coming in or even valued employees today, valuable asset. And like, they're your customers to, to your point. So I think just, it's a mindset change. And I don't know how you do that except for attend a hot topics type event. Jim, Catherine, Hassani, thank you all very much indeed. Thanks, Jim. Thank you.